churches that observe the liturgical church calendar are in the season that they call Epiphany. And now it follows Advent after Christmas. And what Epiphany means is how Christ was revealed to the world. And so I have a passage today that I'd like to read to you of how uh, in the Gospel of John, uh, he shows us who Jesus Christ is. And so I want to read today from John chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse 1. John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus asked. My time has not yet come. Now his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now nearby stood uh, six stone water jars, the kind that are used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, Now draw some water out, and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside, and he said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine, after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their trust, or put their faith in him. Now, as John writes the gospel, uh, he starts at the very beginning. He's very clear about who Jesus is. And so anybody reading this gospel knows from the very first chapter that Jesus is God. He starts with the words, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God in chapter one. And then in verse 14, he says, and the word became flesh. And that's Jesus Christ. And it, it's a very poetic, amazing description of how Jesus Christ became flesh for us. God came and became flesh. So it's very clear in this gospel of who Jesus Christ is. But as you're reading the story, the characters that he presents, the disciples and, and Jesus, they all don't know yet who Jesus really is. And so Jesus is little by little revealing himself to the world and to his uh, closest friends and disciples. Now, as, as he tells his story, he wants to make sure that you understand one thing about Jesus. That if you put your faith in him, if you believe in him, then you become a child of God and you receive eternal life. At the end of his gospel in John 20, verse 31, he says that these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so John wants to convey that message that if we believe and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we trust in his name, then we receive eternal life through him. Now the wedding at Cana, you know, we don't know many of the details about it. We don't know who the couple was. We don't know why Jesus' mother, Mary, was there, but apparently she was there and maybe helping with the wedding because she seems to have some inside information. Now, Jesus was also invited, and his disciples were invited, and many of them were from uh, around this area in Galilee, and so they, it's possible they all knew each other. But weddings in, in those days lasted uh, often from at least three days, and, and many times they lasted a whole week. And the wedding party was to host everyone who was there, you know, to feed them and, and to give them wine to drink, and, and wine was a drink that was known uh, to symbolize joy in their life and 
Uh, wine was also a common drink of the day because water was not as good and pure as what we have today. And, and often they drank, you know, water mixed with wine, maybe two or three parts water to one part wine. And so that was a common drink of the day. And yet at a wedding, it's used, it's supposed to be a wonderful experience where you celebrate. And, and the host was responsible for taking care of them, uh, but they ran out of wine. And so for anyone who's hosting a wedding, to run out of wine would be an embarrassment. You know, you would really be looked at bad as if you had this wonderful time uh, for this bride and this groom to celebrate their wedding and then you ran out of wine. That would be a terrible thing to happen. And Mary tells Jesus they've run out of wine. You know, she doesn't tell Jesus what to do. She doesn't ask him for any favors or something. She just mentions to him the wedding party has run out of wine. And, and then Jesus, as the story goes on, he turns water into wine and he saves the wedding. The wedding can continue and nobody is embarrassed. And then the banquet master even calls the bride and the groom aside and says, you have saved the best until now. And, and the banquet master determines that this wine that Jesus has made from this water is the best. Now we don't know how Jesus turned the wine to water. We don't know the details, the chemistry behind it, uh, because he's God. He can, he can do, do it any way he wants. Uh, but the point of the story was this, this wine that Jesus, uh, when he transformed the water into wine, this wine was the best. And I think that's important to realize that as kind of a side note to the story here, that when Jesus does something, he does the best. You know, there's no half-heartedness or mediocre uh, work or uh, miracles or attempts that Jesus ever does. He always does the best. And in your life, it's important to know that he wants the best for you and for your life. He wants the best for the world. He wants the best uh, for his glory and everything else. He's always thinking of what's the best. And so whenever uh, Jesus asks you to sacrifice something in your life, I want you to know it's for the best. Whenever you go through some suffering or a difficult time in life, I want you to know that Jesus is thinking of your best. I think that's important to remember as we follow him and as we trust in him. So anyway, this is the very first sign or miracle that John presents in his gospel. Why is this so special. What's so special about this miracle and this sign that Jesus did? Is it the wine at the wedding that's so important that Jesus uh, saved this wedding uh, from embarrassment? I mean, is that one of Jesus' main purpose in life to go around and making sure that nobody ever gets embarrassed or if a wedding runs out of wine that he's there to save them? He's the safety net to catch them. I don't think that's the point of the story. Uh, did Jesus come into the world to, to do things like this, to, uh, to just help people when he runs into them, uh, or to make sure that we celebrate the wedding feast? Is that the reason? I don't, I don't think so. But John doesn't waste words as he tells the story, and, and Jesus for sure uh, doesn't waste a miracle or a sign. Everything he does is very intentional and very planned. And this was the very first sign that John records that Jesus did. And I think it's important to realize that this sign uh, points to who Jesus is. You know, a road sign, as you're traveling along, it points to the next city, or it points to something coming up in the road. And, and this sign is the same way. It points to who Jesus Christ is. Now look at the things uh, that Jesus says. Jesus makes four statements in these 11 verses. Jesus only says four things. It's interesting, you know, he doesn't, you know, he has the servants get the water. He has the servants take the water that's transformed into wine to the banquet master. Jesus is just kind of off at the distance. And he only says these four things. And yet, even by not handling the water and, and the jars and everything himself, he still transforms water to wine. He doesn't uh, need to wave his arms or do any hocus pocus or anything like that, he, he, just, he just tells them what to do and, and they obey and they follow. 
Well, the very first uh, thing that Jesus says is, dear woman, why do you involve me? Now, in the Greek language, the word is just woman, and the NIV kind of softens it a little bit and makes it sound a little nicer because it really sounds like Jesus is being abrupt with his mother. And, and yet, uh, this, this woman, you know, calling someone woman in, in the Greek culture and in their language and in the Hebrew day, that would not have been, uh, a, you know, a, a derogatory statement. You know, he's, Jesus is not mad at his mom. Jesus is not criticizing his mom. But Jesus is you, addressing her as woman, dear woman. And just to kind of make this point, in John 29, verse 26, when Jesus is dying on the cross, he looks down and he says, dear woman, here is your son. And he points to his friend John. It says, John is now your son. He's going to take care of you. And it's the same, same word that's used here, woman, or dear woman. And so it's in a term, term of endearment in that case. And so there's no reason to believe that Jesus is being abrupt with his mom. But it does kind of shock us when we read that. And so dear woman. And he says, why do you involve me? And so what is it that Mary is expecting? And it almost seems like as you read through this that Jesus is not ready yet to do this miracle, that Jesus did not plan this miracle. Why is he doing this? And his, but because of what his mom asked that he goes through and he transforms this water into wine. That's, that's kind of the way this picture reads, and this story reads, isn't it? And, and you know, I, I kind of wonder sometimes the relationship between Jesus' mother Mary and, and Jesus as he's growing up had to have been really interesting. In the Gospel of Luke, it records uh, when Jesus, when he was 12 years old, that he stayed behind in the temple and, and Mary and Joseph went on uh, to Galilee to go home and they, they forgot Jesus. They forgot to take him. And they go back and they search for him. And after three days, they find him in the temple. And Jesus tells them, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And they remembered the zeal he had for his father. And Joseph is looking down and realizing, you know, he's talking about his father God, not me. But it had to be interesting raising the child Jesus, Jesus respecting his parents, listening to his parents. When he was tiny, they had to help him. You know, they had to feed him. Uh, they taught him how to walk. They, you know, they taught him the scriptures. He went to school. He, he learned just like any other normal human boy did. And, and being Mary had to be a very unusual thing, knowing that this is the Son of God, the creator of the universe, and yet I'm raising him as a child. And so you see this relationship between Mary and Jesus, uh, you know, honoring his mother Mary because he loves her, because he has a mother like you and I do. And, and, and it's just an amazing picture of what this relationship with Mary is like. And, and you see, Mary knew who Jesus was. And you kind of wonder, had she seen some of Jesus' power? You know, no one really knows if there were miracles that Jesus had done. There are legends and stories about miracles and things Jesus did as a boy, but none of those are in the Bible, and we don't, you know, really give them a lot of weight. Uh, but this, uh, this is really amazing to see that Mary knows somehow Jesus can help. Now, he's not wealthy. He's not going to be able to run down and purchase all the wine that they need. And even if you did, if you think of what a bottle of wine, you know, costs today, uh, even for cheap wine, uh, you know, when they're talking about 20 or 30 gallons and six jars, uh, you're talking thousands of dollars. And if it's a very good wine, like the best wine he's talking about, it could be ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 worth of wine here. This is a huge expenditure and to, by today's standards. And, and so... Jesus didn't have the money to go out, so Mary wasn't thinking, you know, you need to just help them. Uh, I would tend to want to try to help any way that I could. I, I, as a human, I would think of what's a human way to do this. Uh, but Mary doesn't really tell him what to do, doesn't really know what he's going to do, uh, but she knows that he can probably help. And, and, and you see this, this picture where she is asking him to help at this wedding, and he's a little bit reluctant. He seems a little bit reluctant. And he tells her, uh, the second thing he says is, my time has not yet come. 
my time has not yet come. Now that's an interesting thing because it, it makes you sound like Jesus was not ready to do this miracle, and yet I believe he intentionally chose to do this. In John 7, 30, uh, Jesus is teaching in the temple, and, and they don't like what he says, and they try to seize him, but the gospel says that it, but it wasn't his time, and so uh, they couldn't hold him. And then in John 8, 20, he's teaching again, and, they, and it says that no one seized him because it wasn't his time. Those two verses uh, talk about it not being his time. But then as you go on in John, it, it does in chapter 12, uh, in, the very, in chapter 12 to the end of the gospel, chapter 21, uh, the whole thing is about the last week of Jesus' life. And it starts out in, in John 12, 23, it's, he begins to predict his death and that the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He says that now the hour has come, that it is time. In John 13, 1, it, he says that at the Passover feast, that Jesus knew that his time had come for him to leave the world. He knew in his heart that this was the week, this was the time. And then in his prayer with the disciples in the upper room the night before he was arrested, when they're sharing together that, that Passover meal, and he's praying for them, he says, the time has come, and he asks God, he says, glorify your son. The time has come. And so you see... Uh, John paints this picture of what is the time that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about his death. He's talking about when he's glorified on the cross. And that's when he saves you and I. Jesus paid the price for our sins. That's why he came to, the, to earth. That's why God sent his son so that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. That's what his time, that's what his purpose, that's what his hour was for. And so Jesus is telling Mary, you know, uh, it's not my time yet. And, and you see, Mary is just looking at trying to help this couple. But Jesus is looking at his whole ministry. And he knows once it starts becoming public like this, that time's going to come very quickly when he's going to be on the cross. So him changing water to wine, this kindness he did to this couple, also sent him on the road to die for us. And he knows that. And so now it's all starting and it's all beginning. And there's no going back for him. And so the situation, Mary doesn't really understand the full impact of what's happening. And he tells the servants that are there, he says, fill the jars with water. And, and you know, you're talking 20 to 30 gallons each, six jars. It must have taken some time for them to walk wherever the well was and to bring that water back and to fill those jars. This is not a simple endeavor here. And yet if there were lots of servants, maybe they could do it uh, fairly quickly. But the jars that are being used are these pur purification jars. They're used for ceremonial washing uh, that they have. And, and, and John might be telling us, you know, kind of as an aside here, that what Jesus is doing, it's more than purification or ceremony. See, you, you would wash your hands, you would be clean on the outside. But Jesus is going to take that water and turn it into wine, and he's going to clean us on the inside. You see, when he shared with his disciples, he broke the bread and said, this is my body. And he poured the wine and gave it to them and said, this is the wine of the new covenant. Uh, do this and remember to me, this is my blood that is shed for you. This is the blood of the new covenant. And this wine, I think, kind of is no longer just a joy at a wedding, but it's now Jesus is going to have to die for us. All this is kind of happening, you know, as John writes this. And so no longer is it just a ceremonial washing, just following the law, doing what's right, in our, and we have a heart that's rotten on the inside. Jesus is going to wash us clean with his blood on the inside. And so I think uh, having these jars you know, as John tells us this little detail that they were used for ceremonial washing, I think is a little bit important here. Jesus is going to clean us from the inside. It's no longer just surface. He's going to make a difference in our life. He's going to transform us into something new, something better. He's going to take us from water and turn us into wine, something really extravagant. 
And, and I love what the servants do. It says that they fill the jars to the brim. They fill the jars to the brim. They don't hold back. They don't want to miss a drop. They don't know what Jesus is going to do. They don't know what's going to happen. And yet they fill the jars to the brim. And I love that. And don't you think we ought to live like that for God? You know, when He asks us something, we ought to fill it to the brim. We ought to ask God to fill our lives to the brim. We want, we want everything that He's got. We don't want to miss a thing. We don't want to miss a drop. And I love this uh, act that these servants do. You know, filling this to the brim. And then he says, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And so they draw this water out. And I don't know if it's already been changed to wine. I don't know if it changes to wine on the way to the banquet of the master. I don't really know. But these servants know they got the water and they put it in these jars. And now we're going to give him this. And so it's an act of faith, I think, on their part from the servants to take this water, to draw it out, and to give it uh, to the, the master of the banquet. And then the master of the banquet proclaims, this is the best wine I've ever had. And you see, Jesus, Jesus transformed this water into wine. And he did it, it seemed like, with hardly even an effort. You know, he hardly lifted a finger, did he? He just said a few things. And yet he transformed this water to wine. These empty containers are now filled to the brim. The embarrassment of this couple is now turned into joy. This water is turned into wine. And you see, Jesus is showing in this miracle that he transforms people, that he transforms things. He's the transformer. He transforms our lives. He transforms our souls. He makes us holy and righteous when we were sin. He takes away our sin and gives us His righteousness. He turns hate and bitterness into love. He turns anxiety and, uh, into, into peace. He turns death into life. See, Jesus is the one who transforms. And that's really the point of the story. We need to understand who Jesus is. Now, if you look at the context of when, this, uh, when John tells the story, the, the things that happen next, uh, Jesus goes and clears the temple. He cleans out. He cleans house in his God's house, and he throws out the money changers. He gets rid of the old, and he wants to start new pure worship with his God. And then Nicodemus comes to him in, in the night. Uh, this Pharisee, he wants to talk privately to Jesus because he, he doesn't want to be seen publicly yet as a follower of Jesus. And so he comes and talks to him in the night. And Jesus tells him he has to be born again. He needs to have new life. He needs to put away his old way of thinking and living and live brand new. He needs to be born again. And then John's testimony, he talks about how we need to believe in the Son for eternal life. You know, you've had the law all your life, but now you need to believe in the Son to receive eternal life. And then Jesus in chapter 4 meets a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, and she gets a new life because she met Jesus. She gets new respect. Her life is really transformed. Can you see what John is doing, this pattern in these stories? All of these signs, all of these miracles, all these things Jesus does points that Jesus is the one that changes our lives. He completely changes us. This is not just a random miracle that uh, Jesus did just because he loved his mother. I think he did it because his mother asked. But there's a whole lot more to it than that. And Jesus shows that he has transforming power in my life, in your life, in everybody's life, in every situation you're in. Jesus Christ has transforming power. He turns purification water that can only clean on the outside into something that can wash you clean on the inside. It can change your heart. It can change your soul. Jesus turns water into wine. And his blood is, is what changes their souls. Now in the story, all Jesus does is, is tell the servants to fill the jars of water and take it to the banquet master. You know, as far as we know, there's no uh, 
uh, it's not mentioned here, we don't know whether he did or not actually touch the water or the jars or help pour the water or anything like that. Uh, we don't know. But he didn't even have to lift a finger hardly. He doesn't say any magic words or remember some scripture. He just transforms and he just does it. And I want to make sure you see the raw power that Jesus Christ has. He can do anything. He does not have limits. And he's alive today and in your life today, he does not have limits. Now it's a simple thing uh, that he does here at this wedding, you know, compared to what Jesus does throughout the world. Uh, you know, saving a couple from embarrassment at a wedding. Uh, that's, that's, you know, not that difficult. That's not that tremendous. But he transformed this whole situation by changing water into wine and saved this couple, saved this wedding, and he starts his ministry and he moves toward that hour when his time is right. And you see, only God can do this. Only God can take water and turn it into wine. It's really important for us to recognize who Jesus Christ is, that he is God and he can live in us and live in our hearts in our minds, he's with us, his spirit is with us. Do you realize the raw power of God in our lives to transform whatever it is uh, that we're facing? Jesus needed to be their God. Mary needed to see Jesus. You know, that's just not my son anymore, that is God's son. The disciples needed to see Jesus can change us, Jesus can change anything. Jesus is God. He can do the things that only God can do. He, the power of the universe is in him. He has the power of the universe. And, and, and then look at the results that happen in verse 11. It says uh, that this, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana and Galilee. He thus revealed his glory. In other words, this sign points to who Jesus Christ is, that he is really God, who, who's human, he became human, but he's still God. And it says his disciples put their faith in him. And you see, that's the reason for the story. That's why Jesus did this sign or this miracle. It's the first sign. It re he reveals his glory and the disciples put their trust in him. And that's important for all of us to see and to know. Have you put your trust in Jesus? Are you willing to follow him and know that he's going to give you the best? And no matter what he asks, no matter what he says to you, that you say, yes, I will follow. Are you willing to put your trust and your faith in him, no matter where it takes you? And you see the disciples had a difficult road ahead. Every one of them, except for John, was martyred for what they believed and what they taught about Jesus Christ. Their life, uh, they were persecuted and chased and uh, tortured. And yet they still put their faith in Jesus because they knew he could give them eternal life. They knew that he was God. They had seen his glory. They had seen him transform water into wine and many, many other things. Are you willing to put your faith in Jesus today, whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that you're going through? I hope you can do that this morning. Let us pray. Father, let us never forget who Jesus is, that he is God, he is your son. He is the one with power to transform. He is the one that can change us and change our lives. And he gives us the best. Help us to be like those disciples, to read this story, to hear this story, and to understand who you are and to see your glory, and that that changes our lives and transforms our life because we place our trust in you. I hope that there won't be one person that hears this message today that will leave without knowing you as their Lord and Savior, that they turn their heart over to you right now. And just quietly, wherever they are, they say, Lord, I trust you, and I want to follow you. Would you forgive my sins, and I trust what you did on the cross to pay for my sins, and I will follow you for the rest of my life. And I'm looking forward to having you along the way as you're with me every step. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.